As we did last week, we want to honor our nation through the pledging of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, but we also want to honor this morning our Lord as we also pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Bible. Uh, this morning, I've asked the Kelly family to come and please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Let's stand. Salute the pledge to the American flag. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. To the Christian flag, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior whose kingdom it stands, one brotherhood, uniting all Christians in service and love. Salute pledge to the Holy Bible. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word, and will make it a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, and will hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. We've been going through a lot in our nation as a whole with all the chaos that's been going on with the rioting and violence and all. And of course the virus, that's impacted us as well but we ultimately know who's in charge, and that's our God. So at this time, if you would, I'm going to pray out loud, but if you would, join me. You know, our scripture says, the Lord tells us if we're two or more gathered in my name, he hears us. So I would ask that you echo, echo your prayers today as we go to our Lord in pr prayer for this nation. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to you for your goodness to us, Lord. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and what he did for us at the cross, Lord, for the gift of salvation that you promised all that we will take it, Lord. We come to you today to worship you and to draw close to you, to learn more about you, and just to be in your presence in your house, Lord. Today, as we gather, Lord, we lift up this nation, the nation that you have blessed so greatly, Lord. And Lord, we reflect on your words from, from your word, where you tell us, Lord, that if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. Lord, today we humbly come before you. We have become a sinful people, a sinful nation, Lord. Forgive us of our sins, Lord. Forgive this nation of our sins, Lord. Forgive us individually as sinners, Lord, your remnant, your church, Lord. We, your people, come to you today to appeal that you would hear our prayers, Lord. Lord, we know that we don't deserve the goodness that you've given us, Lord. You have given us a way of life that's so much above the standard of most of the world, Lord, and yet we seem to thumb our nose at you and go about our own ways. Forgive us, Lord, for we have failed you, Lord. Lord, today we want to pray for our nation we lift up our nation. We lift up our president, Donald Trump, and his wife, Melania, and his family, and that administration, Lord, that surrounds him, his cabinet, Lord. We lift them up to you, Lord, and we ask that you would forgive them of their sins, Lord, that you would forgive their families of their sins, Lord, and that you would cover them in the blood that was shed at Calvary, that you would cover them completely and totally, Lord, and that salvation would come to their house today, Lord. And if there's any that doesn't know you, Lord, any that doesn't know your son, that they would come to know the Lord Jesus Christ this day. And Lord, we pray for our Congress, the Senate, the House of Representatives, all those elected officials that represent the United States across our land from sea to sea, Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would forgive them of their sins, Lord. We pray that you would forgive those that have come before them and have implemented laws that are not consistent with your will, Lord, that you would forgive those. And, Lord, we pray that you would forgive the families of our elected officials, Lord. We pray that you would cover them with your blood, through the blood of Jesus, and that your spirit would move upon them, Lord, and that salvation would come to their house and that they would come to know you. Their spiritual eyes would be opened 
and that they would see the true God, you, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Lord, we pray for our judiciary, from Chief Justice Roberts to the rest of the Supreme Court justices, to the appellate judges, to the district court judges, their families, their associates, their administrations. Lord, we just pray that you would forgive them, Lord, that you would cover them in your blood, the blood of Jesus, Lord, that they might find healing. Forgive them of their sins, Lord, and we pray, Lord, that you would be with them and that salvation would come to their house today. Help them to execute the laws of this land in accordance with your will, Lord, that they would see things through your eyes, Lord, for what they really are. Lord, please bless this nation. You have blessed us so greatly. Please continue to do so, Lord. Forgive these, dear Lord, of their sins, Lord. Heal our land, please, Lord. And Lord, I just pray for your church, that remnant that remains throughout this land, Lord, that you would hear our prayer, Lord. And Lord, that we would turn, as our pastor preached last week, that we would turn and from our sins, that we would repent, Lord, that we would repent each individually and collectively, and that you would heal us and, and lift us up, Lord, to do your work and your will. Lord, we pray for this nation, that there would be an awakening, a spiritual awakening that, that comes and goes from sea to shining sea, Lord, that you would, your hand would continue to be over us and that the scales would be removed from our eyes, that we may say things for the way they really are. And, Lord, we just pray for our enemies, those enemies that live amongst us, Lord, right here in this nation. Lord, we pray that you would cover them with the blood, that your spirit would move, and you would convict their hearts, that they would see the destruction that they're doing, that they would see what they're doing, Lord, and that they would repent, Lord. We pray for them. And, Lord, we pray for our enemies abroad, those that orchestrate and connive and go behind our backs and wish to see this country fall. We just pray, dear Lord, that the, the name of Jesus Christ would be lifted up in our nation and that they, too, would be covered with the blood and learn of Jesus and find salvation. Lord, we are a pitiful people. Forgive us of our sins, Lord. And, Lord, we seek your face today. We come before you in your house, and we seek your help, your blessings, your strength, your wisdom, your will. Lord, and we ask, Lord, that you would deliver us from temptation, Lord, that you would help us, Lord, to turn the way you have shown us in your Bible, how we can turn our hearts to you and seek you. Today we do that, Lord. And, Lord, we pray that you would hear us. We know you hear us, Lord and that you would forgive this land of its sins, that you would forgive us individually of our sins, Lord, and that you would heal this land, dear Lord. Please be with us, Lord. Heal us of, of the unrest that we feel throughout this land. Heal us of the virus that's plagued our land, and help us once again, Lord, to rise, Lord, to lift up the name of Jesus, to lift up the cross in our land that people may know that we are your people and that the name of Jesus Christ, that the United States would be a conduit to communicate the word of God throughout all this world in, his, in preparation for his return. Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Dear Holy Spirit, we love you. We just pray that you would be with us today, and we pray these things in the holy, precious name of our King, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may all remain uh, stand, standing so uh, we can uh, sing praises to uh, our God.
in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are blessed to be called your people. We praise you this morning. Thank you for allowing us to gather here in your house. Thank you, Lord God, for the presence of your spirit. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that we can worship you openly and that we can praise the name of Jesus wherever we go. Heavenly Father, I do pray for this time of worship. I pray that it will be empowered by your spirit. Every element, every prayer that is lifted, every song that is sung, every note that is played, and pray, uh, Lord God, through the preaching of your word. And I pray especially this morning as we glorify you and lift up the name of Jesus in the, uh, as we celebrate the ordinance of the Lord's Supper together. We love you, we praise you, and it's in the precious and powerful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Please be seated at this time. I do want to share with you a couple things that deal with what's taking place today. I wanted to make a couple of announcements because, you know, sometimes there are things that need to be said. And uh, if I wait till the end of the service, I get going so fast, I just done forget what I was supposed to tell you. As you know, we're in the middle of our baby bottle campaign. Mine's almost full. I think I got a couple more days left. But these bottles are available uh, out in the lobby. So as you depart today, please get one. And the goal is to fill it up with change, bring it back to the church, and then the cho a choice to make, an organization that helps uh, ladies, young ladies who are uh, pregnant to make the right decision for life and to encourage them and help them along the way. This money will go to help out that organization. So please uh, get, a, get a baby bottle, fill it up with change, and bring it back within the next couple weeks. In August, we'll be turning it back into the choice to make. So make sure you have that bottle back here by then. Uh, also, as you know, we are celebrating the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. Now, it's going to be different than we're used to because we don't want to pass the plates around and, and for the sake of social distancing. So in your pew backs, you'll see these little bottles, but I want you to be very careful. This is your, uh, I would say, communion in a bottle. I don't know if that's a proper term for it. But I want to warn you ahead of time because I want to make sure you don't get any juice on you. But uh, I want you to be careful, in other words. Uh, when you get ready to open them, when the time comes, there's a very thin piece of plastic on the top you'll just flip it up that thin piece when it comes out that wafer will be immediately available for you but then when we get ready to do the um, juice portion then you'll take that whole tip and pull it off and the juice will be ready but don't pull it all the way off because uh, you want to be able to drink the juice and not have extra trash laying around. So I just want to, to warn you so that you're careful. And then when you're done with it, you can put it right back in the pew bag. Oops, don't worry about uh, policing it up. We'll take care of that at a later time. Uh, so I, I want us to do this uh, in honor and glory of God, but I want to make sure you're careful. A lot of you ladies are wearing white, and I don't want you to have a little purple stain on your white. So I wanted to warn, uh, make sure you had that uh, warning. Also, if you have not picked one up, here's our eighth edition of the 2020 Challenge. Uh, as you know, uh, we are reading through portions of the Bible. Uh, if you want to pick one of these up, they're at uh, all of the exits. And so just grab one and take it with you. It starts this Monday. As you know, our seventh iteration concluded on Saturday. And so Monday we pick up the next one, which we'll begin reading in 1 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, Timothy, 2 Timothy, and we'll continue through our reading of Psalms. So this helps to guide us through the next 20 days of the 2020 challenge. So please pick one up. All right. Uh, first of all, I do want to thank Brother uh, Allen for that wonderful prayer for our nation and for the Kelly family for uh, leading us in our pledges. And so thank you. I appreciate that so much. And I'm so glad you are here this morning. Perhaps you're here and you're a guest. You haven't been here before. Or it's been a while. In the bulletin, you'll notice a uh, portion called the Connect Card has a perforated edge. If you're a guest here, please spend a few moments of your time filling out the front and the back of that card. That will give us a record of your attendance this morning, but it'll also give us an opportunity to reach out to you and to thank you for worshiping God with us. All right, we're going to continue to worship God right now. Uh, and oh, by the way, uh, Brother Harry's on vacation. He deserves it. He needs it. And so we got Brother Edson filling in for us today. So continue to lead us in worship, please. Please.
Last night I lay sleeping, there came a dream so fair. I stood in old Jerusalem, beside the temple there. I heard the children singing, and ever as they sang, mid heart the voice of vengeance from heaven in earth array, mid heart the voice of vengeance from heaven earth array. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, lift up your gates and see. And then me thought my dream was changed, the streets no longer rain. Hushed were the glad hosannas, the little children sang. The moon grew dark with mystery, the moon was cold and still. As shadow of a cross arose upon the lonely hill. As a shadow of a cross arose upon the lonely Jerusalem, Jerusalem, hark how the angels sing. And once again the scene was changed, new earth there seemed to be. I saw the holy city beside the timeless sea. The light was, God was in the street, the gate were open wide. And how, who would my hand and hold? No gate the moon, no stars by night, no sun to shine by day. It was the new Jerusalem that would not pass away. Amen, and thank you, Brother Edson, for leading us in worship and preparing our hearts. If you will, turn in your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 
I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, go ahead and turn in uh, Luke chapter 22. We'll be looking at verses 14 through 23 this morning. Luke chapter 22. When the Second Continental Congress met in May of 1775, uh, King George III from Britain had not yet answered the list of grievances and the petitions that they had, the First Continental Congress had already sent to him. And so by June of 1776, during their, as they got ready for their three-week recess, they appointed a five-person committee to draft a letter that would state to the world where the colony stood and their case for independence. The people who were on that committee are as follows. It was John Adams of Massachusetts, Roger Sherman of Connecticut, Benjamin Franklin from Pennsylvania, Robert R. Livingston of New York, and Thomas Jefferson of Virginia. Later on, uh, Thomas Jefferson would write that the other four of the committee pressed upon him to begin and to write this document out. As the uh, Congress, Second Continental Congress met again in July, uh, they began to discuss this framework that was written by Thomas Jefferson. And on July 1st, they began to debate and change a few things here and there. But in its entirety, almost all of what Thomas Jefferson had put together in this document are still stood. As they debated it and made slight changes uh, through J uh, July 3rd all the way into late uh, afternoon July 4th, all of a sudden you can hear across the countryside from Pennsylvania the church bells ring signifying that this document known as the Declaration of Independence had been signed. These are the opening words of that declaration. When in the course of human events... It becomes necessary for our people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal status to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A, de a decent respect to the opinions of mankind require that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I mentioned earlier last Sunday as we gathered together, we honored both our nation and our, our God as we uh, did the pledges to the United States of America, the flag of the United States of America, to the Christian flag and to the word of God. Yesterday we celebrated uh, Independence Day across this nation. And this morning we honored our nation and God as well. But we do understand without a doubt that true liberty, as we look at those uh, unalienable rights granted to us by our Creator, one of them being that of liberty, true liberty comes from God. True liberty is our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. The message for this morning as it pertains to the Lord's Supper is simply that. Liberty in Christ. Luke chapter 22, I'll be reading verses 14 through 23. If you are willing and able, please stand for the reading of God's word. Luke chapter 22, beginning in verse 14. When the hour had come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, With fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and, and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. 
Then they began to question among themselves which of them was who would do this thing. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, again, we praise you. We're so thankful that you've granted us two ordinances to which to observe as a church. We're thankful, Lord God, this morning that we can come to you and celebrate the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. But Lord, we're thankful for what it means, the symbolism uh, behind it all. We're thankful for the words you've given to us from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we we'll praise you this morning and ask that you would allow your spirit to speak to our hearts these wonderful truths. For it's in the precious name of Jesus we do pray. Amen. Please be seated. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13, the Apostle Paul wrote the following. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through, uh, but through love serve one another. This liberty that the Apostle Paul was talking about in the book of Galatians is that liberty that we have in Christ Jesus. Liberty in Christ. As you and I look to our Constitution and find that we have this an, an inalienable right of, of liberty, we find true liberty in Christ. As you and I come this after, uh, afternoon to, to celebrate, or this morning to celebrate the elements of the Lord's Supper, we see within the elements themselves that we have liberty in Christ. In John chapter 8, verse 36, Jesus himself reminds us of this truth, of this liberty we find in him. Jesus said, therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. So let me ask you this morning, has the Son made you free? If he has, then you have liberty in Christ. This morning, I do want us to look at the elements of the Lord's Supper. In fact, I want to talk about both of the primary elements found within it. But then I want us to look beyond the elements of the Lord's Supper and look at the purpose for them. So with that in mind, I want to begin by examining the bread of brokenness. The bread of brokenness. In fact, the reference to the title, the bread of brokenness, not only points out the fact that Jesus broke the bread, uh, representing his broken body upon the cross, but it also the brokenness of the circumstances to which they found themselves in. In other words, they are in a time of brokenness. Jesus had already been uh, warning the disciples of this time to come when he would be crucified, that he would suffer. In fact, in the passage we just read, he said, I cannot do this again until I have suffered. It was a time of brokenness, brokenheartedness, a time of a broken religious system. There was brokenness. I, I don't know about you, but when I look across our nation, as Brother Allen prayed earlier, there is brokenness in our nation. There is brokenness in our church. There is a, the bread of brokenness. But there's such symbolism behind that. In fact, when we think upon the bread of brokenness, it ought to remind us of two things. Number one, it ought to remind us of His sacrifice. Who took the bread and broke it? It was Jesus. He took it in his hands and he broke the bread. It was not left up to somebody else at the table to do it. No, Jesus broke the bread. What a reminder that Jesus was not a martyr. Jesus was not murdered, but Jesus gave his life upon the cross at Calvary. It was his sacrifice. No wonder he told us in John chapter 6 and verse 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give, he shall give, is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of this world. In the passage before us, he simply says, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. The bread of brokenness ought to be a reminder to all of us of his sacrifice for us. Here's the second thing it ought to remind us of. It also ought to remind us of our own sinfulness. It ought to remind us that Jesus died for a reason. It wasn't by chance or happenstance. Jesus died for the sins of the world. In John chapter 1, verse 29, when John the Baptist pointed out Jesus who was coming, uh, he points out to Jesus and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. 
And, and the psalmist David wrote about his own sinfulness. You remember that beautiful psalm, Psalm 51. In verses 3 and 4, listen to his words. For I, he says, I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. David recognized that his sin was his and that he was sinning against an almighty God. Remember, Jesus sacrificed himself, but he did it for a reason. We ought to be reminded of our sin you remember the psalm or you, you remember the, the hymn it is well with my soul that third stanza goes like this oh sin my sin oh the bliss of this glorious thought my sin not in part but the whole is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more it is well it is well with my soul you see that's the bread of brokenness and as we come before the Lord's table, it ought to remind us of His sacrifice for our sins. The bread of brokenness. The second element found in the Lord's Supper is obviously the cup. So I want us to examine the cup of the covenant. Uh, in these, this passage, Jesus says, likewise, He also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which was shed for you. Again, there are two things we should uh, be reminded of here. When we think about the cup, as we take the, the cup of juice within our hands, it ought to remind us first of his reconciliatory plan. In other words, it ought to remind us that the blood that it represents was shed for us. It was shed for a reason. It was shed so that we could be reconciled unto God the Father. You see, that was the Lord's plan. That was God's plan from the very beginning. When we go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, there was no plan B, C, D, or E. There was only a plan A. God knew ahead of time of man's sinfulness and what would take place. That's an omniscient God. That's an omnipotent God. That is an omnipresent God. He knew from the very beginning that we would need to be reconciled back into Him. And He provided the way to do so. And it ought to remind us of this. Remember in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, what is often referred to as the Proto-Evangelium, the first gospel mention in the Word of God. The Proto-Evangelium goes like this, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, God speaking to the serpent Satan, and between you, your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his hill. That's the cup of Christ. That's the cup of the new covenant that we celebrate today. God's plan to reconcile us back unto him. There is liberation as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, as we realize that we are now at liberty, reconciled unto God. As you and I think about the cup of the covenant, it ought to also remind us of our redemptive price. The first point is his reconciliatory plan, but it's our redemptive price. Well, didn't Jesus pay the price? Yes, he paid the price, but whose price was it? It was our redemptive price that Jesus paid on the cross at Calvary. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 28, we're reminded, So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him. He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Listen to the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2. For you are bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Another wonderful and popular hymn we sing often reminds us of this. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. You see, that's liberty. Liberty because I am now reconciled unto God the Father because Jesus paid the price of redemption. And that's what the cup of the new covenant represents. The cup of the covenant. The Lord's Supper. We find the two elements of the bread of brokenness and the cup of the covenant. But I want us to consider the purpose of the proclamation. 
the purpose of the proclamation. Well, what is the proclamation? Well, in general, it's the entirety of the Lord's Supper. As we partake in the Lord's Supper, we are proclaiming. We're proclaiming the, the bread of brokenness. We're proclaiming the cup of the covenant. We're proclaiming Jesus Christ. Verse 26 in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, Paul, who received the Lord's Supper directly from Jesus according to his word or according to God's word, it tells us, it gives us that purpose of the proclamation summed up in one phrase. He says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim, listen, the Lord's death till he comes. The purpose of the proclamation. So again, I believe it should remind us of a couple things. First of all, it ought to remind us of the resurrection. It says to to proclaim the Lord's death. Yes, Jesus died upon the cross at Calvary. Yes, Jesus was buried in the borrowed tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. But Jesus did not stay dead. Death could not hold sway over our, our Lord and Savior. But he arose three days later. He was resurrected. How else can we wait for his coming if he has not first been resurrected? And it ought to remind us of the resurrection. Because we're told... You proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. He arose, he arose. Hallelujah, Christ arose. As you and I think upon the purpose of the Lord's Supper, we ought to be reminded of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Secondly, we ought to be reminded of exactly what it says he was going to do, and that is his return. He says to, in this passage that Paul wrote, till he comes. You know, that's the promise of Scripture. That's the promise of Jesus Christ himself in John chapter 14 and verse 3. When he, he says, I'm, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And I'm coming again for my own. What a promise. Jesus is going to return. The promise of our Lord and Savior. The purpose of this proclamation here. The purpose of us participating in the Lord's Supper is to remember, yes, the, the death of the Lord, but to be reminded that He was raised from the dead and He promises, one day I will come for you. His return. The key phrase spoken by Christ is placed in between the two elements in Luke chapter 22. That phrase is, do this in remembrance of me. How can we not think about the bread of brokenness and be reminded of his sacrifice, our sinfulness? How can we not take of the cup of the covenant and be reminded of his plan for reconciliation? Because he paid the price for our redemption. And how can we not think about the purpose of the proclamation which reminds us that he was raised from the dead and he promises, I will return as well. That's true liberty in Christ. And I believe it's represented in the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. One of the warnings the Apostle Paul gives to us as we see his uh, writings in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 about the Lord's Supper, he warns us that we need to take a look inside our hearts. He warns us, do not participate in the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. He warns us that if we are not deserving to partake of the uh, Lord's Supper, it will come back upon us. So the question during this time of prayer is simply this. Are you worthy to partake in the elements of the Lord's Supper? So what does that mean, Pastor? Well, number one, are you saved? If you have not been saved, this supper is not for you. It's not for you. That's not, it's not a bad thing. It's just not your time yet. You have not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Then this is not meant for you. But Paul was writing to Christians and he was telling them, be warned. Search your hearts and make sure there's no sin in it. The warning that Paul specifically gives is 
to look into your heart and allow the Holy Spirit of God to point out sin in your heart, repent of that sin, confess it to God, get His forgiveness, then participate in the Lord's Supper. So I want to go to prayer right now. It'll be a moment of silence followed by, and I'll close it with a prayer. But I want each of us to consider, are we worthy right now at this moment to participate in the elements of the Lord's Supper? Let's go ahead and stand together and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, as I reflect upon my life and what's in my mind and in my heart, I've, I, I remember the times I failed you. And I'm sure that's true for each person who is here. And Lord God, I pray that if there is any sin within me that I have not repented of, confess to you that your spirit will point that out. Allow me, Lord God, to repent. So that I can be worthy and that each person here can be worthy to partake in the elements of the Lord's Supper. Lord God, I pray for that somebody who might be present this morning. Who has not yet have taken that step forward to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And I pray, Lord God, that your spirit will work upon their hearts. Even now, as we've talked about the elements through your word, your spirit is so powerful, your word is so powerful, that through a simple and short message, of, you can do such mighty works, that you can save somebody. I pray for that somebody who needs to know you. I pray that uh, they'll receive your son as their Lord and Savior by the power of the spirit and through your word. Lord, I do pray that as we participate in the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, that you, will be ble that you will bless this time together and that you would be glorified. We love you, we praise you. And it is in the precious and powerful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Please be seated at this time. I'm going to ask uh, our chairman of the deacons, Brother Tom, uh, Gresset to come on up here, as well as Brother Tom Grant, our vice chairman for the deacons. As we go through the elements of the Lord's Supper, they're going to be leading us in prayer at different times. I mentioned earlier that this is going to be slightly different, and that is because we do not have our, our deacons that are going to be passing plates. So you'll find the elements right there in front of you in the pew backs. So if you want to go ahead and secure that at this time, go right ahead. Uh, as I mentioned earlier also, uh, or I have not mentioned this, but there are a couple deacons that have uh, trays with them. And if you're finding any difficulty or if you're in need of an additional package, then please just uh, get their uh, notice and they will come to you and uh, help you out. So look at the pews in front of you because that's where you'll find the juice and the wafer. We now come forward to observe the ordinance of the Lord's Supper given to us to celebrate in memory of his broken body and his shed blood. It is said on the night before he was betrayed at the conclusion of the feast of the Passover, which he and his disciples celebrated. He took the bread, having blessed it. He broke it and gave his disciples and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Brother Tom Gresset is going to lead us in prayer at this time. Lord, we thank you for the many blessings you give us each day that are always here without our asking. We thank you for the ones that come before us that make it possible for us to be here today. Luke 22, 19 says, And he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given to you. Do in remembrance of me. Now, as we take bread in recognition, acknowledgement, and memorial of Jesus' body for the Lord's Supper, help us to remember what Jesus went through at the cross. Jesus had a cruel death. 
He was nailed to the cross. A crown of thorns was thrust on his head. He was whipped. He had stripes, stripes. to the body. His heart pissed and given vinegar to drink when he, at, when he was thirsty, but he did not drink it. The Lord's Supper is a memorial supper, a ceremony of remembrance. Jesus said to continue celebrating the Lord's Supper in order to remember him. Thank you, Jesus, for sacrificing your body for the forgiveness of our sins. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 6, verse 58 says, This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. He that eateth this bread shall live forever. On the same night, our Lord took the cup, and having blessed it, excuse me, and having blessed it, uh, he, he said, this is my blood, which was shed for you. At this time, Brother Tom Grant, our vice uh, chairman for the deacons, is going to lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you sent your son. And Lord Jesus, we do so appreciate your coming, knowing that without your death on the cross, there would be no salvation. We thank you for your blood that was shed for us. And as we drink the cup today, help us to remember that this is your blood, that innocent blood that came to this earth and died. But also, Father, help us to remember in this drinking of the blood the great promise that you shall come again and receive us unto yourself. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you, Lord, for all of your goodness each and every day. In Christ's name, amen. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, the word of God says, And according to the law, I may almost say, all things are cleansed with blood. And apart from the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Paul wrote, for as often as you eat this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Brother Edson's going to come and lead us in a, a hymn of decision. Even during the times of ordinate, uh, celebrating the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, God moves in our hearts. God causes and moves us to make decisions. If you have a prayer need, this is the time to do it. If you have a decision you want to make, please come forward. I'll be waiting for you. Brother, go right ahead. Uh, let's stand, please. Jesus, keep me near the cross. Yeah. 
hope you've been blessed of God by being in his house today and celebrating the ordinance of the Lord's Supper together with your church family. Uh, thank you for being here and for worshiping God. I hope you have a great and wonderful week. Look at the activities that are taking place the, both this week and in the weeks to come. They are listed in your bulletin. I, I will, we're going to close with a benediction, but I do hope you have a great and marvelous week. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, again, we do praise you. Thank you for the truth. Thank you for this ordinance. Thank you for how meaningful it is. And thank you, Lord God, for how impactful it is as well. I do pray for uh, each of our congregants, those who are present right now, for our, uh, and our family and friends of this dear church. Thank you for those who uh, will be participating in the Lord's Supper at home. I pray that you'll bless them. Thank you for those who uh, have not uh, ventured out at church and are still remaining safe at home. I pray a blessing upon them. Uh, but I pray, Lord God, that you would work in the hearts of your people, uh, remembering that uh, uh, the hearts that will be changed first are those of, those, uh, of us in the church. Lord God, we pray that you would revive us, that we might share the gospel, that we might share, uh, spread the love, that we might witness a spiritual awakening in our community. So bless us as we go our ways. Place people in our paths that we can share Jesus with. We love you. We praise you. And it is in the precious and powerful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. God bless you. Here at FBC Florence, we're a family, and we'd like to thank you for joining our family for worship this morning. We this broadcast is made possible by the generous and loving contributions of the members and friends of First Baptist Church of Florida.